1 Peter chapter 5. I hope you took time to read that today. We're going to begin with verse number, oh, let's, let's begin with verse number 1. It's always a good place to start. Verse number 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1, and we'll read down, uh, uh, let's see, to verse 11, okay? All right, 1 Peter chapter 5. And verse number one, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. What a great verse. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for that great verses, uh, that great chapter that we just read. What a blessing it is just to read it, just to realize it's coming from your heart, from your mind, from your lips. Thank you, Lord, for the precious word of God tonight. And we pray, dear God, tonight that you would do something unusual in this service. That something said, done, will just be etched in our hearts, in our minds, in our life. We ask, dear God, that you'll help us tonight. Protect this meeting, Lord, with your precious blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A preacher friend of mine called me this morning, and he said, I'm going to give you a statement. And I don't know if it's original with him or if he read it somewhere or heard it somewhere. But when he told me, I said, I've got to write that down. And I've got to share it with the church if you haven't already heard it. And the statement is this. Job, Job, y'all know who Job is, right? Job made it with so little and we struggle with so much. Now think what Job did not have. Job did not have a Bible. Job did not have a church. Job did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. In fact, Job did not have a savior. He didn't, the Bible says he didn't have a daysman. It's not so with him, he said. He didn't have the Lord Jesus like we had. He had God. Job did not have a wife that supported him. Job did not have friends that supported him. Job had no church, no fellowship, nobody to lean on, and yet he made it. He made it because he trusted God. And yet we have so much. We've got a church, we've got a Bible, we've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, we have the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we have a fellowship, we have a building to worship in, and yet people will come to their pastor or the preacher and they said, I don't know if I can make it. Well, why not? If you have all of this, why can't you make it? Why can't you make it? So I thought that's an astounding statement that Job made it with so little and we struggle with so much. I hope you remember that. I hope you write that down somewhere. Well, let's look at chapter five and let's look at marching toward glory land. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? We're going to heaven. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. But we're on a pilgrimage. We're, we're not to settle down here. We're, 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 we're to be kind of like uh, Abraham who moved his tent from one place to another. He never settled down. Let's look at the word pilgrimage for just a second. Chapter 1, and uh, if you look at verse number 17. Chapter 1, verse number 17. This life, this Christian life, is a pilgrimage. 
All right, chapter 1, 17. All right, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your, what's the word? Sojourning, same thing as pilgrim, sojourning here in fear. Now, if you look at chapter number two, verse number 11. Verse 11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain, abstain from fleshly lust with war against the soul. A sojourner is a trap, by definition, a sojourner is a traveler or is a temporary resident. A sojourner is a temporary resident of a place. He's not there to stay forever. He's sojourning, he's on a journey. He's a stranger, he's a traveler who dwells in a place for a period of time. Now there's a, there's a great verse on this, just what I just read you. Hold your place here in 1 Peter. Let's go to 1 Chronicles. This is a great verse on the subject of being a pilgrim or a sojourner. Now go to Kings, go to Samuel, Kings, Chronicles. You'll find 1 Chronicles chapter number 29. 1 Chronicles chapter 29. I, I've had this highlighted in my, in my Bible for a while. 1 Chronicles chapter number 29, the last chapter, I think it is. And if you look at verse number 15, 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse number 15. And you'll have to say amen when you read this. 1 Chronicles 29, verse number 15. Here it is. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow. Well, how true that is. As a shadow. And there is none abiding. That means you're, you're not gonna be here forever. We're seeing people pass off the scene. We've seen it in the last couple of years in our church. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not gonna get any different. People are still gonna pass off this scene. Whether by natural, but I'm looking for the spiritual passing. I'm looking for the rapture, aren't you? But we're gonna go somewhere. We're not gonna remain on this earth. We are pilgrims, we're, we're sojourners. And so pilgrimage by definition is a long journey, a long journey. But ladies and gentlemen, doesn't it seem like it's been just a short time when you're in your 20s or 30s and now you may be in your 60s, 70s, 80s, maybe even close to 90, if not in your 90s. And it just seems like a short time. It's a short time. 90 years is a long time, isn't it? But compared to eternity, it's short. And you'll say, man, where have the days gone? Where have the years gone? I remember when. And your mind goes back to the, those times. But we're passing on through this life. We're, we're sojourners. We're pilgrims. And um, in fact, Genesis 20, uh, 47. Let me read that for you give you a reference Genesis 47 and verse number 9 that's when Joseph's brothers appear before him in Genesis 47 and uh, verse number 9 all right jot that down for scripture reference come back to it later verse number 9 Jacob said to Pharaoh unto Pharaoh and Jacob said unto Pharaoh the days of the years of my pilgrimage there's the word the days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been and have not attained into the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So we're all on a pilgrimage, aren't we? We're all on a journey. Now, let me give you three things about this pilgrimage that we're on. Number one, there is the pilgrim's attitude. We're passing through. What should our attitude be as we're passing through? Should we drive our stakes down deep and hopefully not pull them up again or should we just drive them in loose because we're moving out of here? Well, let's look at verse five, six, and seven. First Peter five, chapter five, verse five, six, and seven. Likewise, now here's the pilgrim's attitude, all right? Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. 
And of course, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Now, what is our attitude as pilgrims? Well, first of all, it needs to be one of submission, the humility of attitude. In fact, the younger pilgrim is to be subject to the elder pilgrim. You see that in verse number five, the first part of that. Look what he says, likewise, ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder. <clears throat> now, a lot of people don't like that word submit, but the word submit is found in the Bible several times. And especially when you start preaching on the family and the pastor gets up, the preacher or evangelist gets up and says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The wives get a little nervous there, a little twitchy. And, uh, and they're thinking, oh, if you only knew my husband. Well, God knows your husband. And so that, that attitude, yeah, amen right there. That attitude is to be one. That wasn't Joanne this time, was it? Okay, okay. Right. well, amen. You got a buddy here, Joanne, right now. So anyway. <clears throat> one of submission, one of submission. The younger is to submit to the elder. Now the word submit simply means to be under obedience. Now, do you know who was an elder as we look at this scripture? In verse number one, it says he's writing to the elders. Peter's writing to the elders. He says, the elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder. Peter was an elder, wasn't he? He was an apostle, we know that. He was a disciple, but he was also an elder. Now, an elder, let me give you a definition. An elder was a governing official of a local congregation, but it also means older, it also means senior. So when you go to McDonald's and they say, would you like to have an elder coffee? They don't say that, they say, would you like to have a senior coffee, same thing. But an elder was not a lord, he was not a dictator, he was to be an example to the flock according to verse number three. Now a lot of people say, well, do you have elders in the church? Well, look around you, a whole bunch of elders around here, amen? So, <laughs> why is it that people say, well, you shouldn't have elders in your church, you're a Baptist church. Why do you think elders belong to the Mormon congregation? You know, the Bible says that there are certain offices in the church, in the New Testament church. One of them was bishop, one of them was deacon. They had elders. We just don't use that name, but if we did, there would be nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it, unless we go out line of, uh, outside of the scriptures. So an elder, Peter was an elder, but an elder was, sort of, was kind of like a governing official. He was not a lord, he was not a dictator. In fact, he said in verse three, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. So an elder was not a lord, he was an example. In verse number two, he was to be a willing, look at it, verse, feed the flock of God. That was the job of an elder. Who is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now he was to be a willing overseer with a ready mind to feed the flock of God. That's, that's what an elder did in the Bible. And the Bible says they went about every city, certain cities, and ordained bishops and elders. You say, well, preacher, I never heard that before. It's in the Bible, it's in the Bible. You say, but what about the pastor? Well, God gave apostles, prophets, no more of those, pastors, evangelists, or evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we have pastors, teachers, evangelists, there's elders, there's bishops, there's deacons. All of those are included in the New Testament Baptist Church, or Baptist Church New Testament Church. And so that's, what, that's where we got that from, okay? So if you call me elder, <laughs> I won't get upset if you're calling me elder because of my position and, and not my age. Okay. All right. So the pastor, <laughs> the pilgrim's attitude is to be one of submission. All right. In verse number five, it's to be one of subjection. Now it's almost the same thing. Now notice what he says in verse number five. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. We got that. <clears throat> 
Let me just say that. The younger, let me just talk about that for just a second. Younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. You ever, you ever deal with these, uh, maybe I shouldn't say it. Are we still online? <laughs> you ever had these uh, snotty-nosed, smart-aleck kids trying to tell you what to do as an adult? They think they know it all? Well, we were like that when we were their age, weren't we? We thought we knew it all. And so in the church, the younger is to submit themselves to the elder. Why? Because the elder knows a whole lot more, maybe by knowledge, certainly by experience, they know more than the younger. So there's the submission. And I, and I don't think we have any problem there, but there's some people that do, obviously, in this church here, he would tell the younger to submit to the elders. Look, I, I, I am not beyond asking people older than me, what would you do in a situation like that? I think that's wise, by the way. I think that's wise. And uh, really in, area, in, in, in any area of life. And if, if I happen to be a plumber and I've got two years of plumbing under my, under my coat and I wanted to, I had a job coming up and I didn't know anything, you think I'm gonna go and ask somebody younger than me or older than me that's got experience in the plumbing business. I'd go somebody older, somebody that's been through the problems that I'm about to face. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Just makes sense. Well, our attitude, we're pilgrims. Our attitude is to be one of submission, one of subjection. Now, three times he's gonna use that word submit or in subjection. Look at uh, verse number five again. Verse five, likewise ye younger submit yourself. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, subject one to another. Well, here, here's what we think. I'm not gonna be subject to him. And the other one says, well, I'm not gonna be sub subject to him. Therefore, we have the next few words and be clothed with humility. Now, when the Bible says that we are to be subject one to another, it doesn't mean we're bowed down and kiss each other's feet and all that stuff. He's not talking about that. But the word submission and subjection, it's simply humility and attitude. This speaks of humility and action here. It, by the way, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it means to yield. It means to resign or to surrender to the power of another. Three times that word is used. In chapter number two, look at chapter two. Look at verse number 18. Servants, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. And then he uses the word in chapter three and verse number 22, same word. Verse 22 talks about Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So it means to yield, to resign, to surrender. Look, we're pilgrims. We are to have an attitude of submission of subjection, and then one of, I would call self-abasement. In other words, in other words, that's humility in action. It, and it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's always about the other person. What's in it for me, I hear people ask. What do I get out of it? It's not about me. And by the way, it's not about the, a part. It's about the whole. You see what I'm saying? It's not about the part of the church, it's about the whole of the church. In fact, Philippians chapter two and verse number four gives us a great verse on this. Philippians chapter two, verse number four. Humility in action. Philippians two, four, very familiar. It says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now that is the pilgrim's attitude. We're not gonna stay here on this earth, we're on a journey, and so we need the pilgrim's attitude. But then, guess what happens? In verse number eight and verse number nine, he says, be, vi be sober, be vi vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walked about seeking whom he may devour. Now, you know what we're gonna find out? We're gonna find out that as a pilgrim, you've got a certain attitude to face, to, to practice, but then you're gonna have a certain adversary to deal with. He says, he says, be sober, be vigilant. Two things here. We find the pilgrim's adversary. 
what is what are we to do as pilgrims when we have an adversary called the devil what is our directive well he says two things by the way on our way home we're going to have enemies we will he said i just like to be able to get along with everybody well i would too but that, that's not going to happen i hate to burst your bubble but that's not going to happen you're not always going to get along with everybody you, it, it's not going to happen not in the, not in this life not in this life that's why god's going to have to change us especially baptists man you rub the baptist the wrong way you're in trouble but he says two things here he says that according to our adversary there's two things we got to do number one we got to be sober we got to be sober and we're not talking about not drinking or anything we're talking about being alert now the word sober means calm it means serious have you ever met somebody they just joke all the time i mean they just joke they they, they never have a serious bone in their body i mean they would they would tell jokes at a funeral i, I mean they, they just they're, they're just not serious god says we need as pilgrims we got a real enemy and that enemy is the devil and he is our adversary and we've got to listen we got to be sober we've got to be alert we've got we got to be calm really we can't fall to pieces on this and so it means not under the influence of a passion there's some there's some of god's people god's dear people man they'll go off the wall with a whole lot of stuff i had somebody the other day was uh we were talking about the end times and we were talking about the uh catholic religion and, and so forth and they began to show me pictures inside the vatican and all this stuff it looked like a big cobra big snake and all that and and it did not honestly it did not interest me because I've read the Bible and I know where I'm going and I know where lost people are going and what difference does it make what's inside of a cathedral or whatever. That has nothing whatsoever to do with my Christianity. It has nothing to do with my life right now here on earth. I'm not going to be tied up with all that stuff. I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to dwell on that stuff. You, you see, we need to be sober because the devil can get us, um, get our minds on things like that instead of what he's really doing in this life. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 and um, verse number 6. I think Brother Bill taught on this. Not had not been too long ago, has it? First, Second Timothy, let's look at Titus chapter number 2, verse number 6. Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. To be sober-minded. That is, to be calm, to be serious, not be caught up in some kind of a passion. And then we have that word vigilant. In fact, the word vigilant is only found two times in the entire Bible. Here, of course, and in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. And here's what it means. It means just to keep awake. How many times you've read in the Bible where God tells the church to awake out of sleep? Vigilant, we better be vigilant, we better be awake because our adversary the devil walketh about seeking whom he may devour, may devour. Now, you remember Cromwell's advice to his troops? He said, trust in God and keep your powder dry. All right, in other words, be alert. Keep away, realize what's going on in this life. So we have the pilgrims directed, be sober, be vigilant. And then we have the enemy's desire, verse number eight. He says, he walketh about the devil as, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, may devour. He's gotta have permission. He can't devour you unless you give him permission. In fact, he can't have anything in your life and get, unless you give him place. Neither give place to the devil. You know how people have such a rough time? They're letting the devil devour them. They're giving him place in their life. Well, instead of giving him place, give Jesus the place. Well, we have the pilgrim's directive, we have the pilgrim's desire, and then the pilgrim's defense. What is that? 
The pilgrim's defense is what? What, who's he say, what does he say in verse number nine? Whom resist, resist steadfast in the faith. Now we are to resist the devil. How do you do that? We to do it every single time. Steadfast, be steadfast. Don't do it one week and forget it the next week. I see so, listen, I see so much of that in Christian's life. And, I, and I'm thinking, they could be victorious for the Lord, but they don't resist the devil steadfastly. They do okay for a week, and then you won't see them in church. And, then you, and, and, and they do okay for a month or so, and then they just fall apart. You know what they're not doing? They're not resisting the devil, they're giving him place. And you've got to resist him steadfast. That means every time, all the time. You resist him steadfast and with what? In the faith, and faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Resist him with the word of God. That's what Jesus did. When Jesus was tempted, he said, it is written. Next time you're tempted, you open up this Bible and you look old slew foot in the face and say, it is written. All right? He hates the word of God. Don't give him place. Don't let him devour you. He will if you let him. So on our way to glory land, we need the pilgrim's attitude and we need, and, and, and we're gonna run against the pilgrim's adversary, but thank God we are assured of the pilgrim's arrival. Verse number 10, I like that part. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, sell you to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen now there's going to be suffering in this christian life now we're not necessarily talking about physical suffering we're talking about spiritual suffering at times we're talking about emotional suffering job suffered didn't he job suffered paul suffered uh peter suffered there's people in our congregation they suffer they suffer they struggle but it's only going to be for a while he says after Notice what he says, God of all grace called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, ye have suffered a while, just for a while. Aren't you, I was, tell, I was telling Brother Dennis today, I think, uh, you know there's gonna be a time of no suffering and no sorrow and things like that. Do you realize there are not gonna be any taxes in heaven? Amen. Well, there won't be any money in heaven to tax. <laughs> Our riches is in glory in Christ Jesus. But the government one day is gonna be upon his shoulders when he sits upon the throne, at David's throne in Jerusalem. But up yonder, there's gonna be a great arrival. We're, go we're going to heaven, ladies and gentlemen, as pilgrims. Once and for all, we're gonna get settled down. In fact, he mentions four things. He said, after you have suffered a while, he's gonna make you perfect. Now, we're, go we're gonna be perfect, that is, without sin, but the perfection he's talking about here is mature. <clears throat> it's gonna be a day when none of us will bellyache and, ba and be babies and complain about everything when we get to glory. He's gonna make us perfect. Jude tells us that. He's gonna present us faultless one day. I'm looking for that day. But while we're waiting on that day, sometimes we're, we're gonna suffer. But I have to look ahead. I have to look ahead and see what's awaiting me as a child of God. And that's the way you gotta look at things, folks. You gotta realize we're winners. I don't care what they do now in this life, we're gonna serve Jesus because one day we're gonna see him face to face. We're winners. He said one day, he said he's going to, he's going to make us perfect Second thing, he will establish. Now you say, doesn't that mean us establish? No, establish. That's a great Bible word, by the way. You look up that word establish, you'll find about a dozen times it's found in the scripture. But it means, and I like this. Here's what it means. It means to settle in a state for permanence. To settle in a state for permanence. In fact, James, we're pretty close there, Hebrews. James chapter five. Here's what James says about that, about that word established, verse number eight. He says, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. 
establish, Webster defines establish, I, I like this. Webster defines establish as to turn resolutely in a certain direction. I mean, you've got your heart made up, you've got your mind made up, this is the way you're gonna go. Establish. And then he talks about suffering. What else does suffering do? It not only, it, it not only strengthens you, but, or, or establish you, but it will strengthen you, according to the scripture here. Make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and then that word settle. The word settle, do you know what? That word settle, that's the only time it's found in the Bible. I thought for sure it would be found all over the scripture, all over the Bible, but that's the only time it's found here in the Bible. It means a foundation. It means to lay a basis for. One day, folks, we're not gonna be running to and fro. We're not gonna be wondering about this or that. We're gonna be settled down. You know why? Because right now we're pilgrims. But when we get up yonder, we're gonna be settled. There's some things, by the way, as Christian, there's some things you ought to settle in your heart right now. You ought, to set, you, you ought to settle in your heart that this book is the word of God. You ought to settle in your heart that salvation is forever and only by Jesus Christ. There's just some things in your heart that you need to get settled. And you know what? That will establish you. That will lay that foundation. So one day, when we arrive in glory land, we're gonna be in a place that's perfect We'll be in a place that's permanent. We'll be in a place that's, well, we'll have full strength, no weaknesses, no infirmities, and we'll be in a place where we'll settle down once and for all. But the greatest thing of all about going to glory land, ladies and gentlemen, is that we will see Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? So until that time comes, until that time comes, Let's keep pushing on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you, Lord, that right now we're just pilgrims passing through. We're sort of like Abraham, Lord. We're looking for a city whose foundation, her maker and foundation is God. Lord, we know it's up there, up yonder. We have read about it in John 14. We know you've prepared a mansion for us in glory. But a mansion would not be anything, and glory would not be anything, and heaven would not be anything if it wasn't for your son, Jesus. So we want to thank you for him. But because of him, we can have all these things that you've given us, that you've promised us. Father, if there's one here tonight that doesn't know Christ as Savior, would you please save him? For we do ask it in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.